listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. All Hit Radio. To the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you live and around the world from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Exxon Broadcast Network, on the Talkstar Radio Network, and in Europe on Radio X, worldwide toll-free, 1-800-610-7035. My email address is exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And our website, www.exxonradiotv.com. Next donation, you can go to our TV site at www.exxonetv.com and watch full interviews of our broadcast show, including interviews I did with Michael Horn, Jose Escamilla, Stephen Bassett, Stanton Friedman, and much more. That's a www.exonradio. I'm sorry, exontv.com. Too many exons, you know that, right, guys? We're going to be crossing the Great Pond right now. We're heading off to Lincolnshire in the United Kingdom. My guest this hour is Gary Hesseltine, and he served in the RAF police from 1983 to 1989 before spending an almost 24 year career in the British Transport Police. He was home office trained, uh, detective constable for 18 years, working on all matters of inquiries, including murder, manslaughter, and rape. He was an advanced police interviewer of witnesses and suspects. Gary was involved in the London bombings inquiry as a special interviewer of first responding police officers. In January 2002, while still serving as a police officer, he launched an unofficial unofficial national database for police officers reporting UFO sightings in the UK. And that's www.prufospolicedatabase.co.uk. Now, following the sudden death of UFO magazine editor Graham Birdsell, he launched his own online e-zine called ufomonthly.com, which he has run for 41 issues between 2004-2007. He then spent 12 months as the co-editor of UFO Data Magazine. And let me see, in 2010, he was presented with the PRG Disclosure Award in Washington by Stephen Bassett, another good friend of the Exxon. He was given the Exopolitics Great Britain Award in 2012. And having examined the best evidence, he could conclude on circumstantial evidence basis that some UFO sightings involve extraterrestrials who are indeed acting with planet Earth. Now, uh, he he has a UFO magazine that's up, but we're going to let our guest do some talking here. Joining us now from Lincolnshire in the United Kingdom is our guest this hour, Gary Hesseltine. And Gary, welcome to the X-Zone. Thank you, Rob, for having me on. It's great having you with us, my friend. Kay, congratulations on your awards, and my hat is off to you as one former cop to another for the great work that you've done. Uh, thank you. We all, we all try to do our bit. We certainly do. Now, what was it, Gary, in your life that you know made you focus on UFOs? Well, it's something that I never anticipated would be the case, but I had a, a, a sighting when I was 16 uh, that kicked off my interest, uh, but it wasn't really until the mid-1990s, mm-hmm. by which time I was already a police officer and already a, a young detective, uh, that I came across Graham Birdsell's UFO magazine on Leeds City Railway Station, 
and uh, it blew me away because I'd had a, uh, obviously an earlier interest when I was 16, and then I went away, had a life, had children, you know, served in the in the Royal Air Force, I basically went away and had a life. But then that magazine kind of just reawakened the fact that I had an interest in this subject. And what amazed me was that in the intervening 16, 17 years uh, from having my original sighting to coming across that magazine, basically we were still facing exactly the same story and frustrations in that period. For example, um, when I first started reading about UFOs, mm -hmm. uh, it was in the, in the mid-70s, and they were still having this debate, what are they, you know... Uh, Donald Kehoe said they were ET. Other people's just said, you know, it's just uh, misidentification. The media uh, treated it very, uh, with a bit of fun, basically. And all these years later, in 1995, I came across the magazine and it was talking about pilots chasing UFOs. And, and I'm thinking, well, has nothing changed? And, and a sense of frustration grew within me over a number of years as I began to follow that magazine. Uh, and, and I guess out of that frustration, I had the idea for the police database for police officers. People say, write about what you know. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I suddenly basically had this idea uh, to uh, research police officers. I knew there were already some historical cases mentioned in a few books. Uh, and so I thought, I'll write about police officers. I know police officers. So basically, that's what I did. It launched... In January 2002, I started with six cases involving uh, 10 British police officers. And now, in 2016, I have over 550 cases wow. involving about 1,050 British police officers. 1,050 British police officers. So you can see that uh, it's grown exponentially. I never realized that would be the case. I still actually think I've only scratch the tip of an iceberg i think one in ten officer reports anything for fear of ridicule or a perceived threat to their career advancement uh so i still think it's the tip of an iceberg but obviously a thousand police officers is a lot by anybody's stretch of the imagination and we're talking about professional witnesses here we're not talking about you know sam, sam the dry cleaner we're not talking about bernie the taxi driver we're talking about professionally trained observers Profes absolutely you know we're, we're talking about it you know and you're talking about the cream of the crop of society well uh i would say that you would say that sure. perhaps other people wouldn't but what is important uh, uh is uh, i'm not a big lover of statistics mm -hmm. but of those cases 70 percent of all the cases on the database so that's 70% of 550 cases are multiple police officer witness cases, i.e. more than one. Mm -hmm. So it's often two, three, four. In one case, 24 officers from, from six or seven different geographical vantage points all looking at the same thing. So those kind of cases, often five and six, are very common on the database. And for me, all those officers cannot be wrong. No. With their very detailed descriptions, you know one of the one of the more uh, more familiar cases that I am fam uh, that I know for a fact happened it was in the small municipality of Hudson, Quebec, along the Ottawa River, where where a number of officers from the Hudson Police Force and other mm -hmm. adjoining municipalities were chasing a ball of light along the road, main road that went from Hudson to Rigo, Quebec, along the uh, Ottawa River. And well, that can that can be echoed in, the, in on the cases in the UK, yeah. uh, because uh, there's at least half a dozen cases that I can think of where police cars are chasing uh, a UFO, often at treetop height or yeah. just above treetop height, for maybe ten, twelve miles. Exactly. And then another case that I investigated was the wife of a Royal Canadian Mounted Police officer, who was on her way home, and. With her, with her two daughters in the car who had just finished figure skating, and she was buzzed by a UFO. Again, um, what I would say to that is, 
I've had very many validation moments, uh, and when they happen, the airs go on the back of your neck because you yeah. realise just how real this is. Yeah, and 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 what you've just said there echoes several cases where not only police officers contact me, but members of the public. And on one occasion, within a week, um, somebody rang me, a, a woman, uh, to tell me about her experience of driving with the two kids on a lonely country road, and then a UFO the size of a car at hedge top level, die of six, seven feet off the ground, is running parallel with the road and follows the car mm-hmm. for about a mile and a half as the kids are screaming, as you would. Yeah. And then a week later... Somebody in a different part of the country told me an almost identical story, except for the fact that it wasn't the size of a car. It was a tubular cigar-shaped object the size of the length of three cars running parallel with the car for about a mile and a half on a lonely country road. Now, when you get those validation moments, Mm -hmm. you know you are dealing with something extremely real. And I will bet you, and now you and I have not talked before this, this interview, and I just nope. want our listeners to know that. I will bet you that that cigar-shaped UFO that you just described, the lengths of three cars, also had portholes along the side, the long sides. And there was light emanating from the inside out. Yeah, there always light emanating yep. from within. Uh, in this, those particular two cases, they didn't have portholes, but many, many cases of police officers witnessing UFOs have uh, rows of windows or what are perceived as windows uh, that are emanating light. But, I mean, let me just kind of like just show you the range. I've got a police officer case uh, involving two armed British uh, police officers who were guarding what's called close protection in the UK, a uh, highly prominent, well, he was then a government minister, and uh, he was on the way... Uh, traveling to another destination and because uh, they needed to stop halfway as it were he stopped at a countryside residence uh, for overnight before carrying on the journey the next day well these two police officers uh, he was in bed the the minister's in bed and it's one of those lovely uh, bright summer mornings where the sun comes up and it's beautiful whatever the weather turns out later on in the day it's one of those days when it, everything's blue and the sun is shining, and it's five o'clock in the morning, and they are walking around this kind of like country manor, large property, ministers safely tucked up in bed, and they're walking around, just chatting in the grounds, and then suddenly the sky goes dark. And as they look up from what was bright sunshine, they see a huge cigar-shaped object directly above the minister's property where he's sleeping, that's uh, the length of a football field, mm. and it's just hovering, motionless, no sound whatsoever. It is huge. One of them, they're both carrying sidearms, goes for his weapon, and his mate stops him and says, I don't think it's going to do much use <laughs> because of the size. But it's kind of like that instant reaction. I've got to do something. Yeah. There's a minister in the house. And then suddenly it shot off in the blink of an eye and stopped in the distance on the horizon, and then shot off again. Now, why are uh, police officers going to tell me a story like that if it isn't true? It's so ludicrous. Nobody would make that up. What have they got to gain? They're going to get ridiculed if that story ever gets out. What is this again? And the answer is nothing. These people are telling the very... There's very few people who are able to come forward to who they feel relax that they're not going to get ridiculed so that is one of the advantages of being a police officer or a retired police officer that you've got that instant report and you know you suss out over the years you get an instant report uh, and a gut feeling as to whether these people are being truthful or not with you and i'm sure you've found the same sure have i sure have um having been in the raf and you know you're you're extensive career as as a law enforcement officer what is your take on what happened in the randlesham forest well if you don't know i I, i've actually done a lot of research there and for seven years had a close collaboration with colonel charles holt who was obviously wrote the holt memorandum of an extremely important document 
Um, sadly, I ended that relationship corroboration period last year over some comments that I disagreed with him about one of the uh, witnesses, uh, Larry Warren, who was the original whistleblower of the case. Yeah. He was ma- he was making uh, unsubstantiated derogatory comments, and I thought that was wrong, and I told him so, and he persisted, he did it once more, and I said, I don't want to work with you on that basis because you're not presenting any evidence to back up your claims. Fine if you've got evidence, but if you haven't, you're making terrible claims about somebody that you shouldn't be doing unless uh, you've got the evidence. And there was no evidence. And I actually know Larry Warren very well, and uh, I certainly don't believe what Holt was saying. So I took that decision to end that. But during that seven years collaboration, uh, I went to Rendlesham Forest with him on two occasions, uh, I've been to Rendlesham Forest many times. I've met John Burroughs. I've met uh, um, um, Jim Peniston. And uh, I have, with my detective experience, what I have done and lectured on many times is what's called a cold case review, mm-hmm. where I take out the evidential data, uh, kind of strip it bare, uh, and, and then lecture on what we've got. And, and what we've got with Rendlesham Forest uh, which many of you in the state still may refer to as the Bentwaters incident, so I do think that title is going more towards Rendlesham now, uh, is the fact we have got three confirmed nights of UFO activity. And this is what makes it so amazing, that three back-to-back nights between the 26th, 28th of December, 1980, we have UFO activity at or near the base. And, you know, on the first night... Uh, we've got the Peniston and Burroughs landed craft. Nobody's doubting that there is a landed triangular craft in the ground that leaves ground impressions, uh, that leaves background radiation that was confirmed by Nick Port many years later as being seven to eight times higher than ordinary uh, background radiation. Uh, the, uh, on the second night, um, uh, the officer that was on duty, a female officer, Bonnie Tamplin, she was spooked by something in the forest that made her so frightened that she had to go sick and actually didn't go back to work there. Um, she was withdrawn and Holt confirmed that. Uh, and then on the third night, we have Holt's night and the Larry Warren night, uh, both happening uh, either simultaneously in different parts of the forest or possibly in the same general area, uh, but there there's certainly incidents going on on the third night with multiple officers. And over the three nights, you're probably looking at 20, 30, 40 wow. um, US Air Force police officers involved who see various aspects of the phenomena. But at one point we lo- on the first night, we're talking a landed triangular craft that's three meters by three meters, that's either sat on the ground or very close to the ground. Then on the third night, Holt's out there with his team and he confirms on his audio cassette, which is a piece of physical evidence that could be presented uh, into a court of law right. like any other kind of uh, tape or, uh, you know, in a murder, it could be yep. produced. You know, so it's that piece of physical evidence that could be produced in court that where he's making uh, intermittent live a commentary of what was a live UFO incident. Well, that doesn't happen very often uh, at all. And you certainly very rare that you get a lieutenant colonel of his standing, the deputy base commander of what was, make no doubt about this, what was a nuclear tactical nuclear base uh, going on the record saying he went out and saw UFOs, multiple UFOs himself. Now, that doesn't happen very often. And hence why... The Holt Memorandum, in my view, is one of the top five UFO documents in the world because of the rank that's that's actually corroborating that this event was witnessed by other officers, including the deputy base commander. And what he's also did for me, and I've got it on video, he also confirms to me that um, he turned the radio channel, he had access to three radio channels, uh, when the UFO, when his part, When he was in a field and a UFO stopped above his team and shone a laser beam type light down at his ground with he and his other four men, basically that lasted for 15, 20 seconds. Cutting a long story short, after that they see a UFO towards and over the base. But because of where they are 
in the woods, they cannot see where the laser beam that is being shone down over the base is actually going. They think it's near the weapon storage area, which is the nuclear storage area, because I worked on two of these facilities during my time in the Royal Air Force. I guarded at two nuclear bases, so I know exactly what those officers were witnessing. And basically, or the layout, and basically what happened was he then changed the radio frequency to the tower frequency, the high tower in the weapon storage area. Every weapon storage area has a high tower that's got a 360 perspective higher than any back trees in the in the area, so it can have this full 360. And basically, he heard on the radio that the guy in the tower was saying there are beams being shone down into the nuclear bunker. Wow. Now, that is an incredible thing, and he's put that on video for me, and I've, and I've published it. Uh, it's there on the UFO Truth magazine website. Right. And and it's there on, if you go to the link that's on the YouTube page, you'll find that video where he's actually saying that. Um, but it's an incredible case, and, uh, you know, how often do we get three nights of uh, UFO activity and, uh, and, and get somebody of his rank actually confirming that it all took place? Gary, why do you think the governments are still still saying, no, 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 it's it's not nothing nothing happened, you know? Like why why the suppression? Uh, well, if you're talking about Rendlesham, I think I think what you've got to understand with Rendlesham is that it's a it's so good a case that um, if ever there was going to be a game changer in the UK mm -hmm. that could make the Ministry of Defence actually come clean. It, it might have been that one, but I think they very quickly made the decision that uh, they they kind of want to wash their hands of it, which is basically what they've done. The broader question is why, and that stems really because the United States, unfortunately, is the most secretive government in the world on UFOs. And with our special relationship that we've had over many years from colonial times, mm -hmm. the UK generally follows America's lead. Uh, and that's what we've done. And the Ministry of Defence have lied. There's no two ways about it. They've been less than honest. Uh, they've lied persistently over the years and downplayed this subject. You know, I mean, if if something is is going into a nuclear bunker, if a deputy base commander is saying he's seen multiple UFOs and he's put a written document into the uh, to the Ministry of Defence, uh, isn't that have got to be of defence significance? Well, certainly. Well. Well, but according to the Ministry of Defence, in 50 odd years of, inve of supposedly investigating and detailing UFO reports, uh, there's never, ever, ever, ever been a case that's been of defence significance. No matter how many times uh, uh, um, military pilots uh, and uh, UK RAF jets were sent up to intercept, I mean, there's, there's a classic case, uh, Super Sabre, American. Uh, flying in 1957 over uh, the east of England. Mm -hmm. And he's ordered to fire his salvo of 24 rockets at a radar-confirmed UFO. And, uh, you know, if that's not of defence significance, then I think we all should uh, get a different job. I would imagine so. Listen, uh, Gary, you and I have to take our news break at the bottom of the uh, of the hour. We're, we've uh, put the, uh, the commercials aside for your interview because this is such a great topic and we appreciate you coming on at 2 o'clock in the morning, your time. Uh, so, I'm nocturnal, don't worry. All right, so just bear with us for a few minutes, my friend. Exo Nation, Gary Heseltine is our special guest. www.prufospolicedatabase.co.uk is the PRUFO's police database. And for the truth, UFO Truth magazine, it's a 96-page bi-monthly uh, easing featuring articles by many of the world's leading researchers. Uh, you just have to go to www.ufotruthmagazine.co.uk. Gary and I will be back on the other side of this short break as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Once again, for a small programming note tonight, Dr. Uh, Susan Cole was supposed to be our guest in the next hour. As everyone knows, she is a a uh, medical doctor, and she is also a surgeon. She was called into an emergency surgery situation, so she has uh, sent her regrets, but we understand that. You know, God, take care of the patient, whatever you do. We can always, and we have rescheduled her, and we'll let you know when she'll be back on. But 
what we decided to do is replay the interview that I had with Bill Bean last night. He's a spiritual warrior and an exorcist. If you'd like to uh, send us an email, it's very simple. Xone at xoneradiotv.com on all social media sites. We can be checked out as Xone at Xone, Xone Radio TV. And our main radio website where you can listen to the Xone 724-365 as well as the live show Monday through Friday from 8 p.m. until midnight Eastern, www.xoneradiotv.com. Once again, Gary Hesseltine is our special guest this hour. www.prufos policedatabase.co.uk and for the UFO Truth Magazine www.ufotruthmagazine.co.uk We'll both be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Wilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we will weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Jeff Gilson didn't go out looking for adventure, danger, or the answers to most of the controversial political intrigues of the past 30 years. But he found all three when he began investigating the mysterious death of his close friend, Margaret Thatcher's favorite speechwriter. Just an ordinary guy living in a small, sleepy suburb 20 miles outside of London, Jeff's questions provoked a powerful response on both sides of the Atlantic. He was shot at, warned off by the CIA, and formed a close bond with one of Israel's most notorious intelligence officers. Relive Jeff's gripping adventure in his fast-paced book, Maggie's Hammer. Peel away the layers of establishment deception and discover, as Jeff did, that his friend was an assassin with British intelligence, that Great Britain has been America's secret hitman for the past 30 years, and that Princess Diana was not the target in that Parisian tunnel. All of this and more when you visit www.maggieshammer.com and find the link to buying this explosive book online. More and more ordinary people feel they no longer have control of their lives. Jeff fought back. He asked the difficult questions. He set out to redesign his own destiny. And you can do the same using Maggie's Hammer as your guide. Don't waste a moment. Buy it today. Visit www.maggieshammer.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. 
Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash Xone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. And welcome back, everyone. Don't forget, you can go and watch the 13 first episodes of, uh, let me see, the X Zone TV show. We've already started season two, and we also have two other TV projects that are, um, well, I'm going to tell you about those at a later date. Talk about a teaser, eh? My guest this hour is Gary Heseltine. And, uh, Gary, first of all, thanks very much for joining us. A great pleasure talking to you. You're welcome. You were one of the witnesses at the 2013 citizen hearings in Washington, D.C. What did you think of them? I personally think it was the best thing I've ever been involved in, in the subject. Um, I know a lot of people may have a different opinion, mm -hmm. but what they attempted to do, and in my opinion did do, was set forward something that was done as properly as, uh, as it could have been. There was uh, a proper panel, it was time, there was a timekeeper, you had a, a one former senator and five congressmen and women. They were there every day, 80, 80 years of public service between them. Uh, you had witnesses uh, coming in in various batches on different aspects, pilots, etc., science, uh, uh, experts, various testimony. And it was done over five days. And unfortunately, it did not uh, get the mainstream coverage that it should have done. Uh, I, I do have some reasons why I, I think that was, uh, but I think it was a tremendous thing. And, and we, Steve Bassett, uh, really did do a great job, I think, in, in presenting mm -hmm. uh, pretty much 35, 40, 40 witnesses uh, to credible people. And, 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 and one of those amazing things that happened was that at the end of the first day, uh, Congresswoman Kilpatrick stood up and said after one day, and it was almost a eureka moment that caused a big outcry and loud cheering, which I guess wouldn't have happened in a real congressional hearing, but basically she said after one day, you should, we should have congressional hearings, real congressional hearings, because I can see that the evidence is highly compelling and we should have that debate. And unfortunately, it seems to have gone on to deaf ears. But I, but I, I think it's brilliant. And I think that uh, if people haven't seen it, they should look it up. It's there. Uh, and uh, there's some brilliant testimony uh, from pilots, from senior uh, researchers, scientists, etc. It's brilliant. You know, and I, I know that uh, Captain Robert Salas was there. I know that uh, the Honorable Paul, Paul Hellier was there and, and a great many others. And and I, like you, congratulate Steve on a job that he did very well done. And I, I can't understand why there has been not more attention placed on the congressional hearings, the significant findings of that hearing, even though it was, it was citizens. But that, that raises a question. Isn't the great United States of America based on for the people, by the people? I think it was. Sadly, I don't think it yeah. is now. 
when when uh, um, Eisenhower said in his closing speech, uh, speech, we must guard against the rise of the military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. He said that I think in 1960. Well, I think we pretty much lost it in the 1960. Uh, so so pretty much he was saying that the intelligence services, big business, is taking over and running things. And I actually think that that is the case. Uh, and I think we are in uh, not a good place uh, where uh, the world, uh, I think, is secretly being dominated in certain areas by big corporate businesses and the intelligence services. Quite how you get that back, I don't know. But I'll give you my take on why, uh, and it may be controversial, this, as to why I think there was no mainstream coverage. Uh, I think there would have been a lot of mainstream coverage to the citizens' hearings but something happened a week before, and here's my take on this. A week before, Stephen Greer uh, premiered the serious movie, which he had trailed for over a year, uh, many, many times, said, this is E.T., we have got a body of an E.T., this is E.T., this is E.T., and he oh, said yeah. that consist consistently for a year. Mm -hmm. Now, let's just say you're a mainstream uh, reporter. Well, somebody's saying to you, yeah, we've got the evidence, We've got it, we've got it, we've got it. Show I'm it. going to produce the evidence. They will have been interested in that, just in case we did have the forensic evidence that it was E.T. It would have been a major story. But a week before, oh, actually, it's not. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting human, a very small human, yeah. but it's not E.T. All that momentum that built up over the year died, and all those mainstream that were following that thought, oh, here we go again. So they weren't interested in the week later when the citizens' hearings, and I do believe that was a factor. Quite why it happened, quite why there was a premiere so close to what was an unprecedented event, I don't know. Is it, is why, it, you would, why you would trail something and say it's E.T. for a year when it wasn't, I don't understand. What I couldn't understand about that whole scenario was how come Greer, with his medical expertise, did not know that this was a human? Why? Why was he part of it? Why? You know, like, what did he have to gain by it? Was he? Well, was, think, was, I, was, was he? Was he? I, I think. I think there's a very simple answer to that, uh, uh, and it, it's probably money. Mm. Um, that's a controversial thing to say, but probably money. The root of all evil. Absolutely. Why is it? In your opinion, uh, Gary, that the governments of the world do n just not admit to the truth of the knowledge of what they have when it comes to UFOs and extraterrestrials. What's the big secret? Why the big secret? I, 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 uh, I think there's many reasons, but I, I kind of take Stanton Friedman's take on this, which is basically it's the loss of power. Um, for example, if, if, if we had as I believe we did, recover a, a craft at Roswell. If we did, as I believe we did, try to reverse engineer parts of it, uh, how successful, I don't know. That's in the secret world. I'll never have that need to know, but I do think we would try, and we probably did get certain aspects working. Mm -hmm. We may have developed man-made UFOs. I think that is entirely feasible in the secret world. I'll never have that need to know. But, uh, I, I, you know, if you look at it, if we did um, capture or whatever, and we did get technology that used uh, gravity, uh, and you didn't need uh, jet engines, you didn't need a petrol-driven fossil fuels, and we had that many, many years ago in the 40s, uh, it could have revolutionized the Earth. But it may have also, initially, with the advent of the Third War, you know, uh, of the Cold War, just after 45, the Cold War starts. There may well have been very good reasons why they decided to keep it secret. It may have destabilized. It may inadvertently trigger a third world war. I think there was maybe good grounds early on to keep it secret. But once you start telling the lie, as the years go by, it then becomes very difficult. But where I think that we did have an opportunity uh, to tell the story and come, come clean... Mm -hmm. would be uh, when uh, perestroika and the rise uh, or, or the fall of the Soviet Union. I think then, uh, in 1991, that kind of time frame, um, America, who lead the subject on UFOs, 
should have come clean. Uh, yeah. When they didn't, it gets even more and more murky. Mm-hmm. So now we now in 2016, we're looking at a lie that's persisted for 60 odd years. But think about it also from um, do, does it, does Barack Obama really want to stand up on the White House lawn? and say, well, actually, we've known about these things for 60-odd years. We kept it quiet in the public interest. We didn't think you were ready for it. And actually, these things can fly in our airspace with mm-hmm. impunity. Our technology can't get anywhere near them. Well, if you did that, then America's not that superpower that thinks it is. Now, in a terrestrial world, suddenly it becomes very vulnerable and may panic people. So that's one reason. Right. But then you've also got the likes of the big oil companies making billions and billions and billions of, of dollar profits um, based on fossil fuels uh, that suddenly, um, well, actually, we don't need any of that anymore. We've got kind of free energy. We, we don't need to move around with mm-hmm. fossil fuels anymore. Well, I don't think they're going to be very happy about losing all their profits and suddenly go into zilch. Right. So I think there's very powerful economic reasons why a lot of people in power do not want to see anything like this come out because it it it, ha- it, it hacks a, to a different level of technology uh and and with it the, the 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 perhaps the the real free energy that people dream about uh and of course that's not good for big business you know i've got i've got a major problem with the entire roswell story well if you and i had gone to a crime scene gathered evidence and decided to stop at our homes and let our wife and our children play with that evidence and then take the evidence back to the station and put it in an evidence locker, what would have happened to us as cops? Oh, we, well, you'd have brought the chain of evidence and you'd be, you'd be sacked uh, exactly. uh, eventually after a, uh, an internal discipline sure. hearing. You'd be sacked because uh, okay. you're mishandling um, you, you, uh, evidence. Right. The, but, but, but I think... I think reality has shown us, actually, that in UFO investigations, Mm -hmm. certainly in the public domain that we're aware of, when it comes to UFOs, actually, police logic generally just goes out the window. Yeah, but but I'm talking about Jesse Marcel here, who went out to... No, 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 no. no. I I agree. I mean, he... But then again, in 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 a real world, you go to a murder... You go to a, a crime scene, you, you kind of do everything right. But I guess that if you go to a UFO crash site... How did he know, you, it, how did he and, know it was a UFO? How did he know well, that? He assumed. And you see, the, the way I look at it is that as soon as he brought what he believed, let's call it that he believed that he had yeah. UFO parts that he brought it to his home, let his kid play with it, his wife, that broke the chain of custody of, on the evidence, which means that his credibility and that entor- entire story is put under the microscope. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But the only thing I can think with that is is that if you're... Bear in mind, this is 1947. This yeah. is a, a major thing that you've gone to and let's just we, because me and you weren't there we don't know what that crash site looked like now a lot of people will say that there was a gouge and it was over half a mile and mm-hmm. there was huge amounts of stuff well yeah. i mean if there was huge amounts of stuff then maybe some of it still had structure that made it look clearly not like it was a plane or a missile or whatever and and we don't know but if he perceived that it was something extraterrestrial or whatever uh, and he picked it up because of its remarkable uh, properties. Right. Uh, then I I just think there's an element of wow. I'm going to have a little piece of this, and I'm going to show my kid that. But doesn't that, that but nobody doesn't will that, believe? It. But doesn't that show a a great amount of unprofessionalism on the part Absolutely. of a U.S. military officer who's supposed to be the base intelligence officer? I agree. I agree, but I, but I, I kind of I think that because you're dealing with something so out of your frame of reference, I think that many of the uh, natural things that you've been taught may go out the window 
to a degree. Why do we keep protecting Jesse Marcel and his screw-ups? Well, it shouldn't have happened, and, 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 yeah. he, and he did take evidence away. Right. And at that time, it was before he knew that there would be any kind of secrecy about this. So but he wait, kind but, of okay, thought but, this is going to be in the papers the next day. All right, but, here, forget, but, but how, could, how could he assume that, you know? How could he assume that? That this was not going to be anything that was top secret. It was going to be in the newspaper. How, you know, what gave him the authority to make those decisions? He they, shouldn't have. Right. Clearly, he shouldn't have. He, he, he took evidence away from a scene. Yeah. And the, and the other thing that's never considered is if you were in de- indeed dealing with pieces of a crashed UFO as in E.T., yeah. How did he know that it did not contain microorganisms that could have been radioactive, exactly. that could have killed all his family mm-hmm. later on through radiation sickness? He didn't know that. He took yeah. a huge risk in taking anything, handling anything, and taking it to his family. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not a great believer in the Roswell story because okay. there there are more there are more holes in that story than there are in pieces of cheese in in Billy <laughs> Myers uh, in Billy Myers fridge but <laughs> <laughs> well i actually I, I i am not a roswell expert yeah. but I, I i certainly think that with the amount of um testimony from what 6 700 witnesses who played very minor roles but are still parts of the jigsaw. Something clearly happened there. I and, agree. And what, uh, and, and, and what I think is important that takes it towards E.T. is the absolutely ludicrous excuses that the Air Force have put out on the 50th anniversary and they, they put the one ro- report out, mm-hmm. it's Project Mogul, and then it's the crash test dummies, which didn't actually get used until 1954, sure. out the wrong time frame. So the Air Force have muddied the waters if it was something terrestrial, by giving two absolutely terrible excuses. So, there's a, you know, it does point to the fact that there's something happened yeah. without a shadow of a doubt and that, that it wasn't a balloon right. and it wasn't crash test dummies, so what else was it? Um, yeah. We don't know. Yeah. Uh, I personally think that the Rendlesham case, mm-hmm. because it's more modern and because we have the documentary exactly. evidence and the people still alive, is a stronger case. I agree. But I, guess, um, but I guess that's ingrained into the psyche of the American public. Hey, listen, Gary, uh, I hate to do this, my friend, but it's time for us to go. I want to thank you ever so much for coming on the show. I'd love to have you back on in the future. This has been You're a welcome. Great... Can, I, can I just say to one thing to all your, uh, to all your listeners? Of course. Is that if, if anybody wants... A complimentary copy of one of the 16 issues to date. It started in 2014. We're now up to issue 16. If they email me, heseltinegary at hotmail.com, and make reference to the uh, X Zone show, then I will give them a complimentary copy. 96 page magazine featuring many of the top researchers. So, can't be any fairer than that. You're a good man. You're a good man, and any, any, any person that has ever worn a target and that's what i call a police badge a target in my books yep. is super so thanks for all your hard work thank you for your for your dedication and we look forward to the next time you join us here in the exo i would love to come back thank you very much for inviting me on. all right you take care of yourself gary get some sleep all right thanks a lot <laughs> good night gary good night bye bye buddy exo nation gary hesseltine has been our guest this hour what you know this is you know this is an interesting case, the Randallsham. And there you had it. You had it from the horse's mouth. The man who did the investigation, who talked to those who were there. We're not talking about some wannabe researcher who gets into ufology and wants to make a name for himself, find the smoking gun. You're talking about a real police officer, a professional witness, a professional investigator. And a professional interviewer. Hats off to this guy for the great work he does. Once again, if you'd like to uh, visit the website, it's www.prufos, uh, uk, or his UFO Truth magazine, 
www.ufotruthmagazine.co.uk. And um, like he said, if you send him an email and mention that you heard about his UFO e-zine on the Exxon radio show, he'll send you a free copy. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with a bit of a programming change. Dr. Kolb was supposed to be our guest this hour, but due to a medical emergency, she's a doctor. She was called to do an emergency operation. These things happen, and I, and I applaud her professionalism. And we will have the good doctor on the show at a later date. So when we come back from this news break, I'm going to play an interview that we recorded last night. Now, apparently, a number of our listeners could not hear the show because of Internet disruptions. Working all night with Bell Canada and our uh, satellite providers, we were able to find out what the problem was. It was rectified. I apologize to not only the guests who were on the show last night, but to you, the listeners, for not being able to get you the interviews, which are now available on iTunes or Spreaker. They're out there. Once again, when we come back, my interview with Bill Bean. He is a spiritual warrior and an exorcist. And we're going to have, uh, it was a great interview. So please stand by. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. And this is a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And we come to you Monday through Friday from 8 p.m. Eastern until midnight. Right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, and Radio X. We'll be back. Don't go away. Listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. 